now. And then we're going to broadcast. Have a great event, everybody. Um, and just uh, remember to mute and unmute yourself as needed. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're excited to host tonight's Brooklyn Book Festival bookend event, celebrating Indie Press's four-way books and night book books. Tonight's reading features four-way authors, Yona Harvey, Ricardo Alberto Maldonado, and Jeffrey Harrison, and night book, night book authors, Aaron Churin, Aditi Machado, and Carlos Lara. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we get started, I just want to say a huge thanks to the teams at Four Way Books, Nightboat Books, and all of tonight's featured authors for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. So we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen, but the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and to interact with fellow attendees. And if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the authors, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two little speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured books are available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to be able to offer actual shopping in our bookstore locations, 12 to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, and you can purchase any of the featured author's books and many others on site. Or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. You can find a link to those books uh, in the, the book by pages in the chat. I'll be posting it there in just a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured books is a great way to show your support. We'll be starting off tonight with Four Way Books authors. Four Way Books, based in New York City, is dedicated to producing and promoting excellent literary publications and to creating opportunities for writers of merit. They believe that the work of writers brings good into the world, understanding, empathy, curiosity, wisdom, and that if a publisher can be the conduit for connecting writers and readers, for making a writer's life more meaningful and bringing validation to the artists and fine work to public, to public attention, they're spending their days nobly. Yona Harvey is among the first black women writers for Marvel Comics and earned an Eisner Award for her contribution to World of Wakanda, and she co-authored Black Panther and the Crew with Tanahisi Coates. Her first poetry book, Hemming the Water, won the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, her new book, published by Four Way Books on September 8th, is You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love. Ricardo Alberto Maldonado was born and raised in Puerto Rico. He is the co-author, uh, the co-editor of Puerto Rico and Mi Corazón, and the recipient of fellowships from Cantamundo, the New York Foundation of, for the Arts and Queer Arts Mentorship. He lives in New York, where he serves as managing editor or managing director at 92 Wise Unterberg Poetry Center. His new book is The Life Assignment, also published by Four Way Books on September 8th. Jeffrey Harrison is the award-winning author previously of six award-winning books of poetry. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Boliasco Foundation, among other honors. His poems have uh, appeared widely in magazines, journals, and anthologies. His new book is Between Lakes, also published by Four Way Books on September 8th. Yona will start us off with the first reading. Please take it away, Yona. Good evening. Thank you all for being here on a Wednesday night. I'm really excited to lead with my fellow poets. Thank you, Four Way, and thank you, Night Boat Books. I'm going to read the first two poems from my collection, You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love. That. I grew up with pickles. I slept in the attic. Cigarettes, sheets laced with smoke. The heat of my father's brother's old room. Larry Blackman painted for effect and Shaka Khan's lips more like a kiss. If a kiss could walk when it came to life. 
if a kiss could have hips and legs and ass, well, I wanted that. And if the colors could sweat and strip me down to my slip, well, I wanted that too. Nobody knew what I was thinking up there, though maybe they wanted that, that. And the second poem is called Segregation Continuum, and it's written after Ella Baker and Glenn Ligon. Layered in black, on black, on white canvas, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Looking at the way we look, looking forward, stepping back by way of upturned neck, by way of three steps back, looking black coated, by way of black modes, by way of reconstruction, by way of insurrection, by way of colored fountains, by way of elected Democrats or elected aristocrats. It is obvious we are a presence, though we have been discomforted at school gates, at rental offices, at museum entrances. Even we cannot rest who believe in freedom. We are to some an irritant, an iresome, tiresome lot. We do not subscribe just because something comes out of a leader's mouth, out of the mouth of a tyrant. So we are too difficult. We are much too difficult. We are much too aware. We are much too marked. We are all that matter to us that matter. We are the most comforting presence by way of nod, by way of pound by way of sup. We are always fashionable when we do not try. We do not try to insult except when we do, but we do not hesitate to speak of the things about which we agree or disagree. We participate at the level of our thinking by way of our thinking, by way of our mass expression. We who believe in freedom cannot rest where hundreds and even thousands of we ordinary people had taken a position that made us very uncomfortable when we decided, for instance, to walk rather than take the bus. Thank you. And I'm super excited to hand it off to Ricardo. Thank you, Yana. It's always a treat uh, reading with you. Um, I've been reading from my book for the past three weeks. So tonight I'm going to take a break and read a new poem uh, from the next book, uh, which is tentatively titled Foreign in a Domestic Sense. And that's language from uh, the insular cases, uh, which were decided by the Supreme Court in the early 1900s. And that's terminology used to describe the colonies and its inhabitants. Uh, one poem in English and in Spanish. Had to use six words today. If you, America, were locus owning, for example, your Brooklyn of absolute gift, reach safely for that charter of rights for the Republic, its austerity measures, a charter of oversight management and economic stability, it would suggest we were subjects to your dissertation as we were your readers. America, are you the precedent, the sea train in its abstract melancholy? Then forgive us if we lean toward the mystery inside. For example, our brethren called me Capricorn in Bushwick speak in Park Slope, suggested translation of my name, but that was in New Jersey. If I were to find one thing inside Six walls, it would be Marcus, my boss's cat, a deadbolt making my home out of Thanatos so I may hope to be its human 
readers, two weeks after Maria, I sent a text despite keeping no receipt for $3. Oh, America, lay your immense wake over me. I alone in my room for us, I sing. I, America, whom you are holding now in my hand, book, forgive me everything. I've gotten up in my used sheets, America, at six in the morning with a poem in mind, seis palabras que tuve que usar hoy. Si fueses de América su locus, poseyendo, por ejemplo, el Brooklyn de su regalo absoluto, aún alcanza seguramente su carta de derechos de la República, o sea, su ley de control fiscal, ley de supervisión, gestión y estabilidad económica. Sugiere de nosotros, tal y como éramos de sus lectores, América, eres el presidente, el tren C en su melancolía abstracta. Entonces, perdónanos si inclinamos por misterio dentro, por ejemplo, si nuestro prójimo me llamara Capricornio en Bushwick, Speak en Park Slope, sugirió traducción de mi nombre, pero eso fue en Nueva Jersey. Si debe haber algo entre estas seis paredes, debe ser Marcus, el gato del jefe, una cerradura haciendo hogar de su tánatos, que somos más que su lector humano dos semanas luego de María. Mandé un texto a pesar de no tener recibo por tres dólares. Oh, América, abre tu estela inmensa sobre mí. Yo solo en este cuarto por nosotros canto yo, América, ya que me estás sosteniendo ahora en mano, libro, perdóname todo. Me he levantado entre sábanas usadas, América, a las seis, con un poema en mente. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Jeffrey Harrison. Thank you, Ricardo and Yona, for those wonderful readings. Um, we've read together before, and hopefully we'll read together again. Um, I'm going to read two poems from my new book. Um, one longish and the other pretty short. Um, I actually have a piece of art I'd like to share with you maybe during this first poem. Um, I think if Katie has that, here we go. There it is. Okay, this is a photograph by Gary Winogrand uh, that I saw a few years ago. Um, so and the poem is called Girl Carrying a Suitcase. Younger in the photo than my daughter is now, 18 or 19, the same age as my wife when I first met her. She would now be not quite old enough to be my mother, more like an older cousin I saw only in summer and would steal glimpses of or find ways to be near. Just as I kept circling back to this girl's photograph in the exhibition to study again the way her body bends slightly to the right to offset the weight of her fabric covered suitcase against the lighter raffia bag in her other hand. The tapered cut of her sleeveless dress printed with black eyed Susans, one centered over a breast and the way her silver bracelets gather at her wrists below the almost dimples on the inside of her elbows, the photos shadowed foci. And since bringing home the postcard I bought at the museum shop I've been searching her image like a figure recovered from my own past. Someone I almost recognize, though her head is veiled in glare and her hair coming loose from her braids conceals the right side of her face. She gazes downward toward the sidewalk she has just stepped onto from the busy crosswalk, unhurried and alone amid the crowd of the city she is either leaving or returning to, but not arriving in for the first time. She is too unguarded, lost in herself, thinking perhaps of whoever she has just been staying with or is about to visit, someone who, whether cousin, friend, parent, or lover, must surely adore her. If only I could find her and show her this photograph, which almost certainly she has never seen, since it was printed for the first time only recently, decades after the photographer's death, or at least sent her this postcard I've been keeping on my desk these last few weeks, giving this stolen glimpse of her past back to her, so she too might be taken by this young woman who was once herself, 
like someone held dear who left long ago, then one late afternoon shows up at the door. Um, so we, we can get rid of that photograph now. Um, the other poem I'll read, I think I'll read, um, it's one called Higher Education. Antioch, Berkeley, and Columbia were the ABCs of colleges my father said he wouldn't pay for. Breeding grounds for radicalism, he called them, as if their campuses were giant petri dishes spawning toxic cultures. Our own pathology was pretty toxic at the time, both of us stubbornly refusing to learn anything about each other, or about ourselves for that matter, stuck in a rudimentary pattern of defining ourselves as opposites. I wouldn't even look at Kenyon, his beloved alma mater, despite its long tradition as a school for future poets. I hadn't read a word of Robert Lowell or James Wright yet, but I'd read Ginsburg, and the first stop on my college tour was Columbia, and that's where I ended up going. And my father, to his credit, must have seen it was the right place for me, or at least was unavoidable. So he let me go and he paid for it. And the only price I had to pay was when I was home on holidays to suffer his barbed commentary about the very education he was financing, which ironically had to do with the core values of Western civilization. I can't remember, is forgiveness one of them? We both got a C in forgiveness, but later bumped it up to a B minus when in a surprising twist, my son ended up at Kenyon. My father took real pleasure in that, though he was already dying by then. I thought of him at graduation, how proud he would have been of his grandson, who he might have joked was a better student than he had ever been. All our ignorance put aside, at least for that one day of celebration. Thank you. Great, hey, thank you so much all. Uh, now we're going to hear from the authors of Nightboat. Nightboat Books, a nonprofit organization based in Brooklyn, seeks to develop audiences for writers whose work resists convention and transcends boundaries by publishing books of poignancy, intelligence, and risk. Aaron Shuren is the author previously of 14 books of poetry and prose, and his work has appeared in over 40 national and international anthologies. A pioneer in both LGBTQ studies and innovative verse, Sherman was, an, uh, was a member of the original Good Gay Poets Collective in Boston, and later the first graduate of the Storied Poetics Program at New College of California. His new book is The Blue Absolute, published by Nightboat Books on February 4th. Aditi Machado is an Indian poet whose books include Some Beheadings and a translation of Fareed Talee's uh, Prasa Papoia. Currently, she works as the visiting poet in residence at Washington University in St. Louis. Her forthcoming book is Emporium, to be published by Nightboat Books on October 27th. Carlos Lara is the author of The Green Record and co-author of the audio graphic As Data, and his poems and translations have been published widely. He abides in Los Angeles. His newest book from Nightboat Books is Like Biz Business When I Enter, published in April of this year. Aaron will be reading first. Please take it away, Aaron. Mm. Uh, thank you, and thanks to Greenlight and to um, Nightboat and Fourway. Um, and uh, Nightboat published this book, The Blue Absolute, and I'm going to be reading from it. I'm reading from a long poem called, um, what is it called? Shiver. And this is, it's in five, five sessions. This is section four that I'm going to read. And what you need to know is simply that the, there's a narrator who li lives in both the first person and the third person. There's a, a, his mother, and there's another figure who's kind of like a scribe. I think that's all you need to know. This is Flight. Is it an elegy? Was it made up in a sigh of the wind? She checks her barometer as the scroll flaps like a flag. She writes as if in a trance, twisted by the torque of plate stacked over plate, a litany of migrations, displacements, evictions, and lockouts, 
of monoliths tilting and falling blockades of shade. Her boxes full of flattened faces and a string of names rising like smoke. They inspected the floor, the foundation, the walls, the sheetrock and bedrock, the door jam, the beams, but the fissure was in the vision, invisible vision. My green eyes burn. I remember the joy of the torque of the wind with my hair flying and my blue tunic in full wingspan and my arms locked in numberless interlocked arms and the streets slip with dew at any hour. Everyone breathing. Was paradise my evil twin? Did it tar the future with the past? Invisible shadow and draw down the lumbering sky? Now, yes, but the sky behind the sky. I remember, we made it up. He looks around him in a stupor in the corner of his small room on the bent wood chair he clings to in perpetual quake, shivering in the tumbler of rent times 12 and calculates the holes that will land him in her book of voids as she follows her own shivering hand, alive like a slithering cat, stalking the last page. When he remembers, his eyes begin to clear. Her hand passes, pauses mid-phrase. If he remembers, the sky jacks up. Is forgetting my evil twin? If I say him, does history let me in? One after another, as my mother watches from her hospital bed, Still smiling in full sail, she breathes forward and the future forms in her green eyes. It has to be weathered arm in arm. It has to be made up and put in motion and released into the wild. The city shivers in her twitching eyes. Is it an anticipation or regret? I think we never got out of bed, never should, never will, and the warmth remains. I think the scent of common purpose lingers like a map of silver dew. One summer day under full sail, he stood high up on a cliff top at Land's End, Ocean's Edge, where the pelicans in their pterodactyl way formed themselves out of the visible distance in a forward line and flew right by him eye to eye, eye level, face to face, their leathery grit and bony grace, and kept coming single file as if made up by the sky. Emissaries or remnants with their ancient topaz eyes set for primordial crossing, alert to his, but fixed further in common purpose. And the green eyes of the great golden bridge watching and the thrill of the wind, one by one behind another, they flew so close to my high cliff perch, I seemed to fly with them into their visible distance with the old city high inside me as though breathing me into the future in my own now prehistoric skin and bright purposes. I do. And the pelicans making me up in perpetual migration on a forward wing, invisible horizon. And time slowed and the sky slowed, or the wind went still, and the cities merged as my mother's eyes saw what they needed to see, the city in the city, still kissing in blue light. He settles his breath to steady his hand, sings a song he thought was a dirge, but maybe a lullaby for the newborn. Take my hand or wing. It has to be locked arm in arm flung in formation out of the hole in the sky. The city quivers. It has to be made. It has to be made. And uh, here is Aditi Machado. Thank you, Aaron. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, everyone who made this happen. Um, so my book Emporium is uh, filled with many crowded marketplaces uh, of the sort that we aren't allowed to be in right now, uh, nostalgia. Um, I'm going to read for you from the titular poem. 
Emporium. As if I could pass to the cart, hand myself over to some notions piled on a cart, trade away certain desires amid the silk and squid, certainty like a quality of gems and cautious doctrines, trade away myself, wouldn't be too unlovely in derivative light, lamps all succulents above the general meat, would it butchers, for tartan weather, or any grid-like complexity of time, and back to square home. The sugar makes a mound there as once bright pyramids, and the smells here are superlative, all brine and dust as though one upon the other we afford it. And the tapestries descend, and wouldn't we endlessly such velvet landscapes buy? As if I could simply stay here with the provocations. And if I did, what would I sell? And would I look at the mongers and hooks? Would I love these men? I would. Love now is not so corralled, and distance dreams itself out of longevity. Bowie strings a violin. A neat bird suggests the littoral. The lines settle into excellence. Come on, Eros, Aroli, why not the Emporium? The chief comparison is to a quality of light. The people have not poured in as light, won't pour out. The poet's stall, vending short texts and long texts, scarves run through bodily fluids. We live in the clusterfuck. The chief definitions are here now. The chief ethics are of market spinning, carnival eyes, pastimes replete with blinds. The chief binaries fold and unfold. The garden in the kitchen is in the street. Sweet herbs and cow patties. Sweetness, the provocation and cheap style of the poets. The extent to which history inscribes industrial products is perfume, one writes, cupping silver. Petals, petroleum, idioms, profuse and tangled in the neck, a goblet. History paves the emporium and pours the gem light. And says the purveyor, let's not study such shapes, but silk, to me, of silks, of the brushing of blouses against silken nipples, of between her legs the stolen red. And even money isn't quite like money when silk buys me, or have I it, or has it blended in the fabrics of when there was a room for me to try on the, there was weather then, and now too, it's sulking my mind. And the qualities as they continue are the silk under the hand, reads the libel. Silk, that's the dual error and shock of new precision and involuntary, not involuntary exactly, but desired frisson. I've pulled the brocade off the rack. Accents ascend the sound field. Bonnie suns climb the vaulted ceiling. Magnets. My senses, cursive, seek an angle. Sensing danger, name an enemy, nylon. Or did I mean history? Did I mean shale? And of what is it collaged? How does it cohere? Sudden queries, sudden as vendors. Did they sell fruit, sell textile? I've been so exact, I've cut corners. Oh, obsolescence. Oh, light brain sifting the accidental tree. I desire cinema, in a sense, all factories sense the dilemma. Ought I shove off? Um, thank you, and I will shove off now and hand over to Carlos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aditi. Hi, taking it upon myself to uh, record to uh, record five minutes of reading. Five minutes of reading um, earlier today. So, uh, so uh, all right, all right. Here we go. 
is this a formal another pleasure a mineral dro drowsy between this idea and dr dro drowsy chief kiosk of the window flies control farm bashful speakeasy deepers depend total fecundity tumors supplying little asexual programmatic catholic flowers and dispassionate road bloods precepts are true as precepts the burning author herself herself the resounding unsympathetic necromantic why the universal tracing the fog of fuck of coolly satisfied resentment not having one not having lost not having raindrops in the hot box. glossy sutras electric foreground laughter the residue passionless to torture the ground and invented earth a blue striving for theory between misogyny and the obligatory expectation of data the anarchical the superconscious the furrows of monetary virtual seamlessness a decorative new york city alien force and the claim of a, a dramatized squalor tax a terracotta dawn of breasts i said chirp whatever notion whatever cautious thunder fiery affluent melancholy water appalachia tries material breach saturday on earth a singular affect the rarity of wheat Alas, enough cash to bring about the guesswork of this mortifying reproduction of the individual wave, the sunlight streaming. Dawn, later names of blue and gold, the horoscope of having, of having everyone or not. Celebration in this world green cycle when I see what people do, when I see the waves they perform and the origins of drawing, drawing themselves out, attitudes of passage, plural babble, a body misconstrued to scandalize most of my dreams, severe etymology of undergoing a personal season casually, I, I open. <laughs> Along to the reason, the annual night in one's mind is a place for the pie chart singularity it's what i see in people it's the waves they perform hell stays with you the material breach you learn about the american weightless meridian sigh emblazoned i always appear in concussive old me empty-handed this daffy shoot is a feeling yes facing desire Punch bowl scenes, warm burger, closeness. We barely look at the satellites too. I've seen you, recidivist, belted, bloodletting Van Gogh, Bhagavad Gita. I see a yellow nothing formulating a situation. Light upon God, black mass, very phantasmal. What celestial car bombs desire along cauliflower? <laughs> way the guy says it happened wolf bachelor and road blood rising star vampiric pedestal storm microfiche phantom this canister health with geriatric mollified exciting schedule ahead you know a proper teacup oh my eyes I dream abroad in the image's heart. The scoopy afterlife, Marlboro Reds, plain badgerer. The grave, the grave, the grave. Embedded in colored pencil. Enemy drinks, you feel the flavor. As the turning music discovers you now, I see a shape. I see a yellow nothing. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Um, we're now going to open up to questions. So if anybody in the audience has questions they would like to ask, um, please put that in the Q&A module. Um, and we can uh, start the Q&A portion. I can, uh, to get us all started, ask a question that I know um, audiences usually love to know about what everybody is reading right now, or if there's any um, books that you're excited about. Um, if, if any of you have uh, some books that you want to talk about, we can uh, get started with that. I'll go. Um, I've been uh, rereading uh, Svetlana Alexievich um, and her oral histories for about three months now. Um, I happen to have four books of hers uh, here. So I've been spending my time um, uh, listening. Uh, I've been reading Punch Me Up to the Gods. It's Brian Broom's new memoir. And um, I'll Take You There, which is a history of uh, the Staples singers, Mavis Staples and her family, and that music's connection to the civil rights movement. It's a really incredible book. Love that book. Last time I read with um, Ricardo and Yona, I said I was about to start reading Henry Taylor's new book. Henry Taylor's a wonderful poet who disappeared for a while and he reappeared. Um, the book's downstairs. I don't know the exact title. I think it's something about, it has the tilted world in the title, but I am reading it now and it's just as good as I thought it was gonna be. He's a wonderful poet. Anybody else? Aaron, Carlos, the DT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you will um, put on the spot. <laughs> I'm on. I'm on a little bit of a reading hiatus because just because I'm in law school, so I like way too much reading for for class. That is very fair. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no recommendations right now. Um, I've been reading, uh, reading and rereading Salon because. Some of us started a reading group for Salon and reading different translations and comparing. And then a book that I'm really looking forward to is uh, Sean Henry Smith's um, Wild Speech from Future Poem. That's supposed to be out soon, soon, soon. Cool. Sorry, Aaron, I think you're muted. Wait. <laughs> now I'm there we go, sorry. <laughs> I just finally read Ocean Wong's no novel, but I can't remember the name. It's like, because I know the title is beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's so stunning. I mean, I'm late to uh, find it, but it's really an extraordinary work. I was really happy that is one of the first people in a while who I want to read everything that he's going to write. Yeah, that's, I, I love that book as well. It looks like we have a, a question. Um, it's a question for uh, Ricardo. Do you feel an obligation to explain in context the Spanish that you use in your writing? Do you find a way around it? Uh, been battling with this concept when using my Spanish. How do you feel in general about bilingual pieces? Thank you for that question, Jimena. Um, I I feel like uh, right to explain to explain. I I have to go back to the day that I started writing uh, primarily or initially in Spanish, which which was uh, the day after the massacre at Pulse, uh, about half of the victims had left Puerto Rico um, and I felt uh, deep pain, right? Uh, unexplainable pain um, because 
its strength really uh, consumed me. And then um, I wrote one short poem, um, very much a failure. Um, and then Maria made landfall. And um, as now I was really, one of the things that took me by surprise is that, you, you know, I, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. My family is there. I go twice a year. Um, but I've never thought of myself as a member of the diaspora. And um, after Maria, I did, and I felt an obligation as a member of, to, uh, of the diaspora to speak to those back home and also speak with those here. Um, I like to think of uh, the arrival of Spanish into my writing was a gift. Um, and um, I was, I am grateful that Four Way allowed my poems to appear. It's about 15 poems bilingually. Uh, the English appears in gray. Uh, the Spanish is in, is in black. So there is, uh, right, I am setting my own priorities. I found a way, I cracked it, right? I found a way to use my language uh, for home in a way that uh, made sense to me. I feel like what I want to say to you is find a, a, a style or a look or a prosody that works for you, that speaks to your life and to your experience. I actually have a follow-up question to that. Um, uh, because your Spanish is extraordinary. Um, and deeply sounded and um, melodious. And I was wondering, not to negate the, the other territory, but I wondered how much the soundscape was uh, alive to you in, in writing. Uh, so uh, the Spanish feels very much more organic, by which I mean breathing. It's an organism. It sounds it sounds like an organism in Spanish because um, one of the first poets I learned from was Garcia Lorca and the Cante Hondo, um, the deep song. Um, and at times I can't explain it other than sonically there is something deep. Um, and uh, the the English is in many cases this translated or mistranslated or loosely translated, um, which is why it doesn't carry the same kind of resonance. And, and that was a, a, an inten intentional decision. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions, please make sure to post them in the Q&A and not in the chat if you have any. Um, and also, if any of you would like to ask questions to each other, you are totally welcome to do that as well. <laughs> Carlos, I would like to uh, to ask about your fantastic backgrounds um, that I have been really loving. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering about the uh, your your red room background. Is that your go-to sort of like? Is that your sort of go-to background, or was there a particular uh, like it was you, you being in the waiting room? <laughs> yeah, no, that was just, uh, yeah, that was the red room uh, from uh, Twin Peaks. So it's just kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a waiting room, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I was thinking about that, but it's like a, sort of a pre-doing your um, your poetry. It's like being in the waiting room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess the Twin Peaks waiting room is maybe not the best waiting room to, <laughs> to be hanging out in. <laughs> All right, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, so if you have any more, I will stop my uh, my outro um, <laughs> and, and ask the next question if, if people want to get some questions in. Um, but I just want to thank all of you so much. Oh, we do have another question. Okay, wait, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> uh, wonder if Aditi and or Carlos can address translating. Aditi, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thanks for that question, Stephen. Uh, so I translate um, from French um, and um, something, and, and although I didn't read uh, from those poems today, um, there are some poems uh, in my book that have some French in them, and then there are some Hindi and Kannada words too. Um, and um, I put them all in there because um, they're part of my English. 
Um, but also because something about translating that I love is that um, it really changes your relationship to syntax because you're having to think in the rhythms and the logic of another language, whether or not you grew up with it or if you, you know, like I studied, studied French in college and so on. And um, I found that the more that I was translating from French, the more capacious my English became. And so there are ways that I can't fully describe, but I just know that the kind of sentence work that I was able to do, you know, after a lot of heavy French translating um, was just, it was just different. It was, I was able to do more. Um, my English became more flexible, but I guess I also started to feel comfortable um, actually just sort of writing a little bit in French too. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I hope I answered your question. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty general question. Uh, <laughs> um, as far as translation, uh, I translate from uh, Spanish to English, and also I've done some French to English. Um, I have a better relationship with Spanish just because I grew up hearing it, uh, not necessarily in my house, but at both of both sets of my grandparents' uh, houses. Um, so I have a better ear, I guess, for Spanish. Uh, French, I've just kind of, I don't speak it, but I've learned it by uh, just reading dual translations, you know, and then comparing them and, and looking up definitions on my own. So I have, um, the relationship to French is just more on the page. Um, I, I tend to agree with what Aditi said about uh, translating and uh, sort of making her own uh, English, uh, you know, more capacious, I guess. I think that's the word you used. Um, yeah, just like expanding uh, the use of language beyond what you normally would, especially if you're like, if you're looking at translations of uh, like like Vallejo, you know, and Trilce. Um, just, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I can't say anything more than that other than it, it, it just it sort of increases the, uh, your own, the use of your own language, you know, so. Uh, Ricardo, you were um, pretty enthusiastically nodding along. So if you have anything you wanted to, to say in regards to this, you're welcome to. I know it wasn't addressed to you, but. Um. <laughs> I, other than I agree. I, I mean, I feel like there are poets I would never translate, Vallejo being one of them. Um, because I, I can't figure him out uh, in English. Um, but I, I, I know what you say. I know what you both mentioned. I know it deep, deep inside. And looks like we have another question. Um, Yona, this one's for you. Love the poems from your new book. How did the experience of writing these poems differ from your previous work? What surprised you this time around? Well, thank you for that. Um, what was different this time from the last time? I think <laughs> I, there was like a tremendous amount of stress <laughs> when I was writing this book. So it functioned as kind of a escape hatch. So I feel like there were a lot of weird portals and imaginative places that I was traversing in order to I don't know, navigate, resist, deal with the stresses of my daily life. But I hope it comes out, you know, <laughs> a little bit more playfully than that actually sounds. It was actually a lot of fun to escape into this book in that way. So thank you. Okay, um, it looks like that is it for questions. And I just want to thank you all so much. Oh, wait, oh, for some reason this person can't enter the question in the chat. Oh, it's <laughs> me. So yeah, I have, a, <laughs> I have a, <laughs> a question about form for Yona. Um, do you think there's correspondence between the stanza and the panel? Um, I'm trying to see like what connections exist between 
these these two forms uh, you've been working on recently? Oh, yeah, totally. Yes. Uh, just like, so I don't, yeah, just when I think about the line, turning a line in a poem and then flipping that page in a comic, you know, when you get that surprise panel that's on the next page. I loved making that connection when I was working on this book. It was more towards the end. Yeah. And then there's also, I think I mentioned this the last time we read together, that there's a poem that I have that's paneled now in the Georgia Review. So that's an experimentation. It might suck. You might think it sucks when you read it, but it was fun to play around with that idea. So. <laughs> Thank you all so much for this incredible reading. Um, and I want to thank everybody who uh, showed up to watch it. Um, if you miss any of tonight's event, or if you just want to watch it again, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So please look out for it there. Um, and don't forget to purchase your copies of all of our authors' books um, in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And have a great night, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.